And you, you can have your main event of the evening. Hello and welcome to These Days Are Hours, a Happy Days podcast. I'm Peter. And I'm Joe. And today, we are discussing Season 6, Episode 16, Christmas Time. A totally appropriate episode to be discussing at the end of May. Okay, Peter, tell us what happens in Christmas Time. We open in the Cunningham living room, decorated for Christmas. Marion and Joni are back from shopping for presents. Uncle Ben's present. I hope I got the right size. Ugh, Mom, you got him handkerchiefs. <laughs> and they're soon joined by Richie, who is bundled up and freezing cold after spending all day delivering mail. As he thaws himself by the fire, Howard comes home with something special from Cunningham Hardware, an aluminum Christmas tree. This, Marion, is a boon to mankind, a major breakthrough, and a special this week at Cunningham Hardware. Joni's not too thrilled about an artificial tree, and Richie's not too thrilled that the instructions are in Japanese. Marion diplomatically says that it's shiny. The doorbell rings, and Richie answers it to meet an old sailor who says he's looking for Arthur Fonzarelli. Richie takes him to Fonzie's apartment. Fonzie, aided by a trio of girls. Now I ask you, who needs elves? <laughs> is wrapping presents when the sailor arrives, with a packet for him that he says is from Fonzie's father. Fonzie says he doesn't have a father. It's from your father. Whoop, wrong Fonzie, really. I don't got no old man. He has the girls leave, and then asks the sailor how he knows Vito Fonzarelli. He claims to have met Vito in a bar in Singapore, which Fonzie initially thinks is in New Jersey. Fonzie's not too happy that a man he hasn't seen since he was three years old sent him a package. When the sailor asks if there's anything Fonzie wants to tell Vito, Fonzie starts to say something. Yeah, yeah, you could tell him to take this package. Ben says he has nothing to say to Vito. He asks if he owes the sailor anything for the package, and the sailor says Fonzie doesn't owe him a thing before he leaves. Richie joins Fonzie, and Fonzie shows him the presents he's giving to his various lady friends. Rings engraved with, to my one true love. <laughs> That's fantastic. Who are you giving this to? Everybody. Richie asks about the package from the old sailor, and Fonzie admits it's from his father. Richie thinks it's great, but Fonzie does not. How is a package supposed to make up for abandoning Fonzie when he was three? Richie protests that the man is still his father, and Fonzie throws the package across the room and storms outside. At Arnold's, which also has an aluminum tree courtesy of Cunningham Hardware, Richie and Lori Beth are having an argument. They, Ralph and Potsy, agreed on a spending limit for the gifts they got each other. It was Richie's idea. Despite that, he went over the limit on his gift for Lori Beth from Fister's Jewelry Store. This is from Fister's Jewelry Store. The box alone is over the limit. And now she feels cheap. Ralph and Potsy are annoyed that Richie stayed within the limit for them, and they leave for the department store. They want to see if Santa will give them a list of bad little girls. Lori Beth also leaves after telling Richie it's not easy being his girlfriend. I try so hard. Fonzie comes out of his office and asks Richie for help choosing between ties to give Howard for Christmas. He decides to give the other one to Al. Richie asks if Fonzie opened the package from his father yet, and Fonzie reacts badly. When it comes to his old man, he doesn't care what Richie or anyone thinks, and this conversation is over. He goes back to his office to wrap his presents. Al comes out of the kitchen, in a much better mood than Richie, and tries to light up the aluminum tree. Instead, he blows out every light in Arnold's. Richie, you know what you can tell your father for me? -la 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 -la. Later on, Al asks Richie to close up for him while he gets one last present before the stores close. He's joined by Lori Beth, who came to apologize and give Richie his present, an expensive fountain pen. Unfortunately, Richie returned the other present and got Lori Beth one within the spending limit. Nevertheless, they're both happy. Well, it's like they always say, it's the thought that counts. And they kiss. Back at the Cunningham house, Marion and Joni are trimming the tree. The presents are all underneath it, including the one from Fonzie's father. Joni is still annoyed that the tree is artificial, and Marion asks her to think about the house on the corner, which doesn't have a tree at all. Joni points out that that house belongs to the Bernsteins. <laughs> They're Jewish. <laughs> oh, I'm glad. Marion goes to get the eggnog ready, and Howard arrives home carrying a real pine tree. Mary is delighted, and then she carries in another pine tree from outside. And then Richie arrives home with yet another tree. And then Fonzie enters, singing, Deck the Halls, and, you guessed it, carrying a tree. Whoa, you got a whole forest! <laughs> Joni is overjoyed, and Howard says he always wanted to spend Christmas in the woods. Fonzie says he usually does, 
Since it's Christmas Eve, everyone gets to open one present. Joni picks one present for everyone, and Fonzie gets the dreaded package from his father. Fonzie accuses Richie of not giving up, and Richie says he gets that from Fonzie. They have been friends for a long time now. There's a letter with the package, which Fonzie reluctantly opens. In it, Vito admits he was the sailor who gave Fonzie the package. He just didn't have the guts to admit it. Fonzie angrily crumples up the letter, and Richie says he can't keep ignoring this. Richie uncrumples the letter and reads it. Vito reveals he was a merchant seaman when he met Fonzie's mother. I thought I could settle down like everybody else. It didn't work out, because he couldn't stay in one place for too long. It's not much of an explanation, but that's the way it was. Marion finds it heartwarming. Oh, Arthur, your father. But in her defense, she is drunk on eggnog. Howard is disgusted at Vito. Every man has that moment when he wants to give up everything he's got and bum around the seven seas, but most of them don't do that. Vito couldn't handle the responsibility. Fonzie suddenly springs out of his seat overjoyed. Woo! What Howard said made him realize that his father leaving him wasn't his fault. All this time, Fonzie thought Vito leaving was because of something he did, like getting born. But now that he knows Vito is just an asshole, he doesn't hate him so much anymore. Then he opens his present, a silk dressing gown from Singapore. That's in the Orient. The doorbell rings. It's Ralph and Potsy with a Christmas present for Joni, a fifth tree. Guess what we got you? A Christmas tree. You told. And then Al shows up with a sixth tree. The episode ends with Howard taking a picture of everyone together. Thank you, Peter. That was Christmas Time, which first aired back on December 19th, 1978. Happy Days was followed that night by a Christmas episode of Laverne and Shirley called Oh Come All Ye Bums, in which the girls try to make the holidays just a little bit more festive for Milwaukee's poor and homeless. This is just like the first Christmas, Laverne. The only thing we're missing is the manger and all the little furry bees. Hello. <laughs> NBC re-ran a 1973 animated special called The Bear Who Slept Through Christmas with Tommy Smothers as the voice of Ted E. Bear, who was determined not to hibernate through the holidays. Casey Kasem served as the narrator. Ever since Christmas began, everyone has looked forward with wide-eyed wonder to its annual arrival. Everyone, that is, except bears. And CBS had a new special called A Turning Page of History about President Carter's decision to extend diplomatic recognition to China. So of those choices, Peter, what are you watching? I'm intrigued by the Casey Kasem narrated bear special. I want to see if that bear makes it through the holidays. I would have to watch The Bear Who Slept Through Christmas as well. Back in 1978, animation in prime time was a very rare event. Christmas Time was directed by Jerry Paris and was written by Beverly Bloomberg. Beverly had just written The Kissing Bandit a few weeks earlier. As for guest stars, we just have one this week. Eddie Fontaine as Vito Fonzarelli. Eddie was a rockabilly singer turned actor from Massachusetts. In the 1950s, he wrote and recorded the song Nothing Shaken But the Leaves on the Trees. I see my baby again weak in the knee. There's nothing shaken but the leaves on the trees. He portrayed himself in the movie The Girl Can't Help It, but most of his acting credits were in TV. The Six Million Dollar Man, The Rockford Files, Police Story, and more. He also had numerous criminal convictions before and after this show, and he was accused of hiring someone to kill his estranged wife in the 1980s. He died in 1992. Peter, did you have any thoughts about Eddie Fontaine as Vito Fonzarelli? I thought he did an all right job. I admit that it's hard to judge him fairly because I really do not like Vito Fonzarelli as a character. And it doesn't help that knowing that Eddie Fontaine is kind of scummy himself. Eddie has some very disturbing charges on his record. I found that that didn't really change my opinion of this episode because Vito is an unsympathetic character. It's hard to judge this as an acting performance, knowing what I know of Eddie Fontaine's actual life. It's the Scott Bayo Chachi problem. Right. As for songs this week, on the soundtrack, we hear instrumental versions of numerous Christmas favorites. Jingle Bells, We Wish You a Merry Christmas, Deck the Halls, and Oh Christmas Tree. We Wish You a Merry Christmas is heard in both minor key and major key versions which I appreciated. I owe you anything for this? Me? Yeah, you. Nah, you don't owe me a thing. So long. Yeah, that was an interesting choice. In the first scene at Arnold's, we hear Jingle Bell Rock, originally recorded by Bobby Helms in 1957. In the syndicated version of this episode, that song has been taken out entirely and replaced with generic instrumental music. Is it Christmassy? Generic instrumental music, at least? Vaguely Christmassy. <laughs> but it does not sound like anything out of the 50s or 60s. Cultural and historical references this week. Joni says that Mother Kelp's present is 100 proof. Mother Kelp's present, I hope she likes it. She should, it's 100 proof. 
proof is the measure of ethanol in an alcoholic beverage. In America, a liquor's proof number is equal to twice the percentage of alcohol by volume, or ABV. So 100 proof is pretty potent stuff. It's not the highest you can get. There's stuff that goes up to 190 proof, stuff like Everclear. If you really want to get hammered fast, I suppose. (laughs) We're giving our listeners advice on how to get hammered fast. Drink responsibly, those of you who can drink. Joni sarcastically calls Richie Nature Boy. Remember, Mom, Nature Boy here didn't want to be cooped up inside. This was a song recorded in 1948 by Nat King Cole, and it was Nat's first big hit, number one for eight weeks. It's a beautiful song, actually, and I I think it could be a hit Mm -hmm. now. And it was Moulin Rouge. There was a boy A very strange Enchanted boy it was the song at the introduction when Christian is being sad about everything that's happened. Artificial Christmas trees are an older tradition than you might think. The first ones were made of feathers in 19th century Germany, but the aluminum ones were an American invention first manufactured in Chicago in 1958. The TV special A Charlie Brown Christmas helped kill off aluminum Christmas trees, and they stopped being manufactured in the 1970s. We need a Christmas tree. Hey! Perhaps a tree, a great, big, shiny aluminum Christmas tree. Today, artificial trees are made of PVC. That old aluminum one was so fake. From now on, it's plastic all the way. Howard's tree is made by a fictional company called Hitachi. This could be a reference to the real-life Japanese conglomerate Hitachi, which makes everything from electronics to supercomputers to defense technology. Richie asks whether Japanese is read left to right or top to bottom. Oh, Dad, uh... Do you read Japanese left to right or top to bottom? Well, Rich, it depends whether that text is horizontal or vertical. If vertical, it's read top to bottom and right to left. If horizontal, it's read top to bottom, left to right, just like English. Joni says that the aluminum Christmas tree would be nice for a tin man. I assume she's referring to the tin woodman from L. Frank Baum's The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, a book first published in 1900. Why, it's a man. A man made out of tin. The Tin Man actually used to be a flesh and blood human being. Yeah, and his name was Nick Chopper. Nick's body parts were gradually replaced by metal parts until he was entirely tin. I'm not sure why Fonzie, a high school graduate, thinks that Singapore is in New Jersey. I met him at a bar in Singapore. My old man is in New Jersey. Maybe he was thinking of Secaucus. For the record, Singapore is a sovereign island state in Southeast Asia, off the coast of Malaysia. It's about 9,300 miles from Milwaukee. At the time of this story, December 1960, Singapore had only recently gained the right to govern itself. Richie calls Vito an old salt. Is this the one that the, uh, the old salt brought? Old salt. This is a veteran sailor known for telling tales of the sea to the younger crew members. In the U.S. Navy, the title of Old Salt is given to the longest-serving surface warfare officer, or SWO, on active duty. The Navy only has one Old Salt at a time. It's currently Admiral Christopher W. Grady, who just became Old Salt back in April of 2021. Fonzie wanders out of the bathroom at Arnold's, muttering, Busy, busy, busy. Busy, busy, busy. This is exactly what Professor Hinkle says in the 1969 animated Christmas special, Frosty the snowman busy 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 just as richie says tampering with the u.s mail is considered a federal offense hey what do you got in there Uh, federal offense fines but that generally means stealing it diverting it preventing it from being delivered or deliberately damaging it it does not mean looking at it i was just pointing at it well don't point even don't even point no other observations this week the age at which fonzie's dad abandoned him keeps getting lower it used to be 12 then it was four and now it's three and happy days is usually so good at continuity i think they're trying to make the story sadder as they go along maybe more tragic i've compared fonzie to jesus before (laughs) and i have to do it again in this episode he claims everybody is his one true love which sounds like a doctrine of universal love also his dad abandoned him at an early age kind of like what god did to jesus so fonzie becomes sort of an ironic christ figure on the show richie got Lori beth's present at fister's jewelry store so obviously the fister empire has expanded to jewelry rosa coletti has now been mentioned enough times that we can refer to her just by her first name i'll keep this one for your dad i'll give this one to al oh i bet you it reminds him of rosa anyway Hooray! Good for her. I genuinely love that Marion is drunk for a big part of this episode. Marion, I thought you didn't mind the artificial tree. Oh, I love that tree, Harry. I love that tree. Just so shiny and aluminum-y. Has Mother been making eggnog? Since 8.30 this morning. That explains it. 
We don't often get to see that side of her personality. In the episode with the junior prom back in season one on the spiked punch. She's kind of out of it for two thirds of this episode. She's even drunk at the emotional climax of the story. Marion is interpreting the events around her through this haze of alcohol. I thought that added something kind of interesting to the scene. I genuinely do not get Fonzie's joke about spending Christmas Eve in the woods. I always wanted to spend Christmas Eve in the woods. <laughs> I usually do. I mean, I get that he's in the woods with some young lady, but why not take her indoors? It's cold. You're in the Midwest. It is so cold in December in the Midwest. Do not have sex in the woods outside in the middle of winter. You will freeze to death. And this is the second episode in the season with a definite timestamp, Christmas of 1960. So maybe six seasons in, they're trying to finally establish some kind of timeline, like when exactly is this taking place? So, Peter, were there any outstanding Happy Days fashions this week? I really liked Richie's Christmas sweater at the end. It's this white wool thing. It's got kind of green and red with a little bit of blue, I think. It looks really nice and cozy. I will have to rewatch it and notice the sweater this time. I think the one item of clothing that stuck out this time was the robe that Fonzie wears at the end of the episode. I think at Arnold's wedding, he was hesitant about wearing a robe. And I'm not sure if he was hesitant about wearing a robe for graduation. He was naked under the robe from graduation. Did you have any other observations that you wanted to make about Christmas time? I think the first time I watched this episode, I thought Lori Beth was being unnecessarily harsh to Richie in this episode when she said it was hard being his girlfriend. But this time around, with the added context that he had previously been pissy about her talking to men who weren't him, and also that he cheated on her one time. Yeah, it it seems like it would be pretty hard to be his girlfriend. I wondered if their subplot of this episode was some kind of attempt to reenact the gift of the Magi. Of all who give gifts, these two were the wisest. Everywhere they are wisest. They are the Magi. It definitely was. It's not a one-for-one comparison, but that's definitely what they were trying to evoke with the scene of Lori Beth giving Richie the expensive present and then Richie revealing that he got her a different present. One thing I've noticed in their relationship is that Richie and Lori Beth will find things to argue about, often when there really isn't much of a problem in front of them. They will fashion problems out of things, like this exchange of gifts, which should not even be an issue. They exchange gifts and that should be it. And they manage to turn this into an argument. I've noticed in previous episodes where they just have this knack for turning things into fights. Heterosexuals. Yes, that's the joy and beauty of heterosexual relationships. I worried that you'll work in an office, have children, celebrate wedding anniversaries. The world of heterosexual is a sick and boring life. So, Peter, I will ask that age-old timeless question, was this episode any good? I liked this episode better than I did the first time I watched it, because the first time I watched it, it felt to me like the episode was trying to absolve Vito of having abandoned Fonzie by having Fonzie kind of forgive him. But this time around, I got more of the sense that this isn't really about Fonzie forgiving his father, this is about Fonzie forgiving himself, because he feels, on some level, subconsciously guilty, like he did something to make Vito leave. And this is about him realizing, no, Vito was just a dick. He abandoned me because he couldn't handle the responsibility. I have nothing to feel bad about, but I am going to keep the robe because it's a nice robe. I don't think this is as good as Guess Who's Coming to Christmas, which is one of Happy Day's absolute best episodes. But yeah, it's better than the first time I watched it. This is an episode that has always resonated really strongly with me emotionally. I had the exact opposite reaction to you, even upon the first time seeing it, which was that I thought that the really pivotal moment in the episode was what Howard says about what it really means to be a father. You call that a father? Every man comes to that moment when he wants to run away from everything he's got and go bum around through the seven seas. But most of them don't. I understand that there's something called responsibility and this man just couldn't face up to his. I'm sorry, Fonzie. I know it's none of my business, but that's the way I feel. Anybody can just have a kid. The important part is raising your kids and not abandoning them. And I thought in a lesser episode or on a lesser show, just the act of Vito showing up after all these years with a present for his son might have been the occasion for a teary or huggy reunion between father and son. This show is like, no, that gesture of bringing the robe means 
absolutely nothing. And Fonzie doesn't have to forgive his dad or Fonzie doesn't have to consider Vito his father for anything. Fonzie owes nothing to Vito, not even forgiveness. I really like the way that Howard's speech was written at the end. It's, it's a really good speech and Tom Bosley delivers it beautifully. Yeah, I, I think there's some real emotion behind what he's saying. And I just like the fact that Vito is not absolved in any way. As you say, the one who is absolved is Fonzie. Fonzie gets to let go of this guilt that he's been carrying around since he was a child. 20 years is a long time to carry around this burden of guilt for having sabotaged your parents' marriage, which he obviously didn't do. And all the guilt is put on to Vito. So I think this story actually could have two good messages for the kids watching. And Happy Days obviously had a very young viewing audience. And I think one is that it's important to hear that you are not responsible for your parents breaking up or your parents leaving you. And secondly, and more subtly, it's when you grow up yourself, don't be like Vito Fonzarelli. Don't be this guy who shows up 20 years later with a robe in a brown paper box. This is an episode that gets rerun quite a lot. It runs on Christmas and during the Christmas season, I think every year I tend to see it on television at least once. So this is an episode that I've probably seen more than most episodes of Happy Days. It's kind of weird reviewing it because I'm so used to it, but I don't know that it's quite as good as Guess Who's Coming to Christmas, but I think it's a really important moment for the show. And I think it's something that people should see. So I definitely do recommend Christmas time. So Peter, how can people keep up with us and find out about all the wonderful things that we are doing. Listeners can follow us on Twitter at Fonzie Podcast. They can follow me on Twitter at Peter Volfranc. That's P-E-T-E-R-V-U-L-F-R-A-N-C. And they can follow me on Twitter at Joe underscore A underscore Blevins. They can find this podcast online at thesedaysareours.libsyn.com and they can email us with questions, comments, and concerns at thesedaysareourspodcast at gmail.com. So, Peter, what do we have on the docket for next week? Next week, Joni faces off against peer pressure in Smokin' Ain't Cool. And here I was thinking that Smokin' was cool. I'm glad that Happy Days is here to set me straight on that issue. So see you later, alligator. In a while, crocodile. Jingle bell, jingle bell, jingle bell rock. Jingle bells swing and jingle bells ring. Snowing and blowing up bushels of fun. I try so hard.